Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest today is Chris Kane, president of the Center for Global Enterprise, a nonprofit organization, and president and CEO of Mercator 21, a global consulting firm. Plus, he is co-author of Growing Global, Lessons for the New Enterprise. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, Laura. And first things first, happy birthday. <laughs> well, we, can't, we can't let this go on without people recognizing the fact that it's your birthday today. And we want to wish you a very, very happy birthday. And I'm glad to be here. Oh, thank you. I wouldn't want to have anybody else here with me today for a number of reasons. And of course, by the time this goes live in a couple of weeks, it'll be passed. But anybody who wants to send belated birthday greetings is very welcome to do so. I'm happy to celebrate good things any day of the year. Um, but everybody out there, you should know before we get into uh, Chris's work and the stories he's going to tell, um, you either have him to thank or to blame for my being here today uh, in a direct and indirect sense. Uh, as many of you know, I am a quote unquote recovering academic. My original career trajectory was in academia, professor, et cetera. And uh, Chris and I serendipitously crossed paths at a wedding reception about 12 years ago. And just sitting at the table together, started chatting. I was getting ready to uh, graduate with my PhD. And he starts asking me about my research. I didn't really know anything about his background. And as uh, at that time, Chris, you were the vice president of government programs at IBM, correct? Correct. And uh, one conversation sort of flowed into the next. And he said, you know, I've always had an interest in and an instinct about what you research, but I never had the data to back it up. You have the data. Would you be able to come and do a training for my team? And I thought, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> sure. Why not? And one thing led to another and lo and behold, I was in consulting. That was, that was the trigger and uh, everything has spiraled from there. So Chris, I thank you. And on behalf of my listeners, I want to give the benefit of the doubt that they want to thank you too. <laughs> it well, was I'm, I'm glad it, I'm glad it happened the way it did. It was great. And, and you have really launched a, a very impressive and an important um, uh, firm, so congratulations. No, well, thank you, and it's been fun to do a lot of programs along the way. You know, we've we've been to Egypt together, and we've done a whole bunch of other things, which are stories for another time. But uh, give us a quick overview of where you are now, because clearly you are no longer at IBM, and you've launched a for-profit uh, consulting company. You've launched a nonprofit organization. Uh, let's focus on the latter. Let's focus on the nonprofit with the Center for Global Enterprise. Give us an overview of who you serve and what is, what's the real mission of the CGE? Sure. Uh, so eight years ago, uh, Sam Palmasano, the former chairman of IBM and I launched the Center for Global Enterprise. It's a New York-based nonprofit that focuses in on convening CEOs and C-level executives from around the world to talk about how the corporation has changed and is changing due to the impacts of technology and different society trends. Uh, so we convene CEOs to share knowledge. We create uh, applied research on issues that CEOs are confronting and where they can, where, where they're having difficulty finding help about how to look through the windshield of their enterprise versus the rear view mirror. Because so much of the kind of the business school curriculum or the learning that takes place is really about case studies. And of course that's in the rear view mirror. And so what we set out to do with the Center for Global Enterprise was to create a place where business leaders and decision makers could come and work on the challenges that they are confronting in the real in the real world. That's awesome. And we need that kind of support on, on every level, truly. So in your role with the CGE, what are your main responsibilities and who do you need to influence? Well, my main responsibility is to make sure that the, uh, the Center for Global Enterprise runs smoothly and in compliance with regulatory uh, rules, and at the same time is adequately funded to create this uh, value that I was talking about before, the kinds of applied research and the kinds of tools that a CEO or a C-level executive would need or want in order to transform their enterprise and their company to match a global economy. And, and you know, Laura, as you know, the global economy has shifted so much just in the last uh, 15 years, it's gone from being hyper global 
globally integrated. Now to there's a you know a trend and a wave towards segmentation, if not detachment, from the global economy. Yet at the same time, technology has created these forces of integration that are stronger than ever before in the history of mankind. So I think that you have kind of cross-cutting currents. And my job at, at CGE is really to one, be aware of those cross-cutting currents. How do we create value for these decision makers? And then how do we end up executing with, uh, with integrity and compliance on a global scale? And in doing all of this, what's the biggest communication challenge that you or the CGE in general are facing today? Uh, so one, how, this is a really interesting challenge. You want to create a Zoom or a digital uh, conference, webinar, uh, uh, leadership forum, and design it as close as possible to what it would the experience would have been like had you been face to face. And in a face to face meeting, you have chemistry, personal relationship chemistry that develops or at least is available. You have the transfer of knowledge, you have the sharing of knowledge, uh, and you have a feedback loop. And we've spent a lot of time just recently trying to design into our programs all four of those characteristics. And the biggest and the most difficult challenge is the first one, is the chemistry of relationships in a virtual world. Uh, yes. There are some there are some tricks we're learning about it, uh, and we're we just recent just a couple of weeks ago held a digital leadership forum, where we designed in a number of those types of attributes for uh, relationship chemistry, because when you go to a conference, you and I want to know well, you know, did we meet five people who were interesting and important to our careers? How do I do that in a Zoom session like this? And yes. that's what we've been thinking about. And that's actually, you know, everybody out there, I swear I did not put him up to giving an answer like that. <laughs> that is very much what I've really been focusing on work-wise for the last, well, they you know, 10 months and change since we've all found ourselves virtually. The I think the biggest challenge for most people in doing the video-based communications is how to identify and remove so many of the little factor details that make it feel so different from being in person, that make it feel so artificial, make it feel so distanced and so remote and so awkward. And when you learn how to adjust all of those things, which range from the physical, like the lighting and the sound and the camera angles and things, to the way that you have to preemptively structure interactions and uh, even the way you frame questions or frame other things, it can really uh, make a difference in the quality of the engagement, how humanizing it feels, and the results that you can get out of it. So I, I think that's crucial. And that's where my my virtual influence course has come from as well. But uh, it's it's definitely, you've just confirmed that it's something that is experienced all over the world. So and, then, and, it, and it's a relatively new skill that we're being forced to develop, but it's not going away. It's only going to get more pervasive. Right. Right. And even when we can, quote unquote, go back to normal, meaning have events large and small in person, I think people now have the ability and are getting accustomed to doing things virtually. And it's a whole lot more time efficient and cost efficient to do it that way. So I think people will be more judicious about when to meet in person. Um, but that means you have to be good on video. Otherwise, you're missing out on at least half of your opportunities. And that's that's a challenge for everybody. So now you've had a lot of success in growing uh, IBM, in growing Mercator, in growing your, the Center for Global Enterprise, for-profit, non-profit. What's a mistake that you've made along the way or a lesson that you've had to learn the hard way? Oh, this is um, this is funny. It's a, I think about it almost like a Seinfeld episode. I, <laughs> I'm going to refer to it as the necktie, okay? okay? If there was a name for this story, or in a, in a Seinfeld episode, it would be the necktie. So my first job in uh, coming out of college at, in Washington, DC was working for a trade association called the Electronic Industries Association. Okay. It doesn't exist anymore, but at that point in time, it was the premier trade association representing any company that made electronics. Didn't matter whether it was consumer electronics, defense, component parts, telecommunications, it represented it. And I was at 25, uh, I became, I was promoted into a member of the leadership team, which was about 10 people. And they all came from different segments. And one of the challenges that the president laid down to the team was, you know, we need a giveaway. We need something that will 
that when people come to our conferences and they go home, they'll feel good about being there and the, it'll be a reminder that they were there. And let's be creative and let's be, you know, let's be different. And so who wants to take this on? So I said, well, I'll take it on, that's fine. So I went out and thought about a couple of things and I thought, you know, everybody at that, at that time, everybody wears a tie to a conference. So why not, why don't we create an EIA, an Electronic Industries Association tie? Classy, stylish, something that people would want to wear. They'd be proud to wear it as opposed to wearing it in a closet when nobody else is around. So, so I went out and, and uh, met with a fashion designer, a very prominent fashion designer who I happened to know the daughter of and uh, spent a lot of time on this. And I came back with this design and showed it. To, I went uh, person to person to the leadership team and said, you know, here's what I've come up with. What do you think? Uh, they all said, yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. So I had to present the, the idea at the staff meeting the next uh, week. Uh, and having pretty much checked off with about eight people uh, of the I don't know, 10 or 12 members of the leadership team were there, I thought I had the I thought I had the votes to get this done. So I walked into the leadership meeting and brought the ties and laid them on the table and explained why they were what they were. And um, no one supported me. Hmm. None. I got nothing. It was a big <laughs> crickets. It was, it was crickets. It was a big empty tank of gas. And what I learned from that is you have to learn how to call someone out into the open and to do it in a respectful, professional manner, but you can't let them remain silent, especially after they've given you the impression or the commitment uh, that they're with you. So why do you think, I'm curious, why do you think nobody stepped up at that point? I, it's, you know, this is a very trite, but biblical uh, example. This has had biblical impact on me since I was 25. Isn't it funny how the smallest little like, moments of experience leave the biggest impressions on our psyche and those indelible memories of uh, saying, I will never do this again because of that one experience, no matter how big or small. Totally. And I uh, have not forgotten it to this day, obviously. And it taught me a really important communication lesson, which is there's a difference between private communication and public communication, and you have to develop the skill to operate in both, which means you have to you have to learn how to call somebody out into the open. So uh, that's important, and I want to I want to poke at that because if you could go back and have a do over, and you're sitting there in that moment, you say, "So what does everybody think?" and you get the crickets, knowing that as you said, you have to be diplomatic about calling them out because you were 25 years old or so, and these are people who are far more senior senior and uh, you know you you can't just throw them under the bus uh unceremoniously to say the least if you plan on working there for more than another 20 minutes or so. so so what do you do you're standing there in that moment what do you do and how do you do it well i guess i would say uh you know ray we talked about this uh would love to hear your thoughts on it uh, as we discussed it you know, the other day and, you know, Janine, uh, you had a really good point when we talked about this the other night uh, at, you know, in your office, tell me what, uh, you know, are you willing to share what you think is, is good about the idea hmm. and give them a, a forced pathway to be positive. <laughs> nice. And nice. it was, um, you know, it, it just, I just learned that you once, th there are two two lessons that came out of it, one direct, and one explicit and one implicit. So the explicit one was you have to learn how to uh, call somebody out into public so that they don't remain silent. The explicit one is something that uh, we've talked about, which is listen. It's really important to, in communication in order to be a good communicator, mm -hmm. you have to be a good listener. Well, make sure you learn the skill of listening to what they don't say. Mm. And a lot of people, especially in where I grew up in Washington, D.C., from a professional standpoint, it's a city where people don't like to say no, because sure. they're, always, they're always trying to figure out the next angle for how they could work with you sometime down the road. It's the politics. But, politics, exactly. So, but big mistake that people make is that they hear in somebody's words what they want to hear and not necessarily what they said. 
And so one of the explicit lesson that came out of this biblical Seinfeld episode was a uh, my my learning was listen to what they don't say. What do you think they didn't say? What did you miss? I'm with you. I think this is great. I'll I'll talk about it at the meeting. Got it. So the fact that nobody explicitly articulated uh, willing explicit willingness to support or or an intention to act, behave, or otherwise. Uh, and that that might be something to not let the first one-on-one -on -one meeting series end without having double-checked that first. So are, so you sent, for example, to, you've heard what they did say, then to just, you know, dot your I's, cross your T's and say, so does that mean I'll have your support at the meeting? So are we good on this? Are you, you're comfortable supporting this? Or get them to say an explicit yes. Yeah, there's a difference between I th what I was doing was trying to make sure that there were no no's. No was nobody was going to veto the idea. What I didn't do is mm. what I didn't do is flip the coin over and say, okay, how many yeses do I have? Right, right. So you get death by a thousand paper cuts instead of just. <laughs> well, in this case, death by silence. <laughs> yes, yes, killing you softly, as it were. Exactly. Then. What's the next big goal for you, whether personally or for the Center for Global Enterprise? And what communication skills are you going to need to continue to develop in order to achieve it? Well, uh, this is for me. It's not necessarily for the Center for Global Enterprise, but I, uh, my next big uh, skill that I would like to develop is really to learn another language so fluently that I could be bilingual, if not trilingual. And I haven't done that. I have... Uh, and here's the reason why. Linguistic diversity, as you and I talked about in our very first conversation, and respect for other cultures is so important if you're going to be effective, especially in a global context, uh, because you will not be effective if you are only coming at it, communicating with somebody from your culture and your prism. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm an American. I'm going to speak in English. This is what I think you should do. This is my view of you, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's talking and that may be uh, communicating, but it's not having an impact or it's not speaking to influence with uh, influence. So I think learning, um, putting into practice the respect for linguistic diversity uh, is really important. And so I've taken three months of Chinese and, uh, and forced myself to open up a, a, you know, a worldwide meeting of IBM colleagues uh, speaking Chinese for the introduction and the Ch my Chinese colleagues said they didn't understand anything I was saying. <laughs> but the effort was there. <laughs> but, but everybody else, the Germans and the Indians and the Americans and the Mexicans and the, you know, the Argentinians, they all thought it was very impressive about <laughs> my Chinese colleagues. They didn't know what I was saying. We give you an A for effort. We give you an A <laughs> exactly. for effort and, and intent. So it's a I've good dabbled start. with Spanish. I've dabbled with Arabic. Uh, all of Spanish is probably the easiest of, uh, of three, but that would be sure. one. It's funny, you know, living in Japan for, for a number of years, uh, my Japanese got decent. It was never brilliant or anything close to native like of sorts. But, you know, the Japanese are always so uh, appreciative of any effort that an American will show to attempt to learn their language. I realized uh, some of my friends and I decided that we would know when we were really fluent the day that somebody didn't compliment us on our Japanese. Right. When they don't say, oh, your Japanese is so good, then I'd go, Thank you so much for being polite and telling me what I know is absolutely not true, but you're you're quite generous to say so. When they just keep talking, then I know, oh, okay, they don't feel the need to sugarcoat anymore. We can just converse. So that that's my goal, to have somebody not tell me <laughs> my, okay. that my language skills are good. Now, all right, Chris, this brings us to the listener 24-hour influence challenge. And this is an opportunity for you to talk directly to our listeners and to challenge them to take one step that they can complete within 24 hours to have more influence. How would you like to challenge our listeners today? So when somebody asks you a question, um, here's what I have learned to be an, probably the most effective um, aspect of communicating uh, and, and to have an impact or to have influence. And it's to answer first and explain second. Mm. Uh, so over the next 24 hours, when somebody asks you a question, answer first and explain second. I, I'm sure that we all have had experiences, either we do it or we have had it done to us, where we ask somebody a question and you get a long explanation, but you don't, sometimes you don't even get an answer. 
you just get a long explanation. Or if you get a long explanation, by the time you get to the answer, you're so tired and so exhausted, you can't remember or can't focus on what the answer is. So I would really encourage you to make sure that you are not doing that, that you are answer, you're answering first and explaining second, if you feel there's a need to explain. And this is particularly important for people who have moved into management or decision-making responsibilities, having not had those responsibilities formally assigned to them in the past. Because when, you, when you're trying to kind of rise up and, uh, and in, you know, kind of grow your career, you're frequently trying to impress somebody to say, look, here's my idea. I really think it's a good idea. And so there's this need to explain why your idea is a good idea. So part of rising up the ladder is actually being able to be communicate that you know what you're talking about and that you know what you're talking about fully. But once you get decision-making rights, you really need to stop worrying about whether or not you need to explain your decision and your actions. Mm. Now it, it's, it's important to be able to do it, but you don't have to do it first. And frequently people don't make that transition from, yes. from being you know, a non-manager or a non-leader or a non-decision maker to being a decision maker. Because when you're the boss, you're, you can just make your decision and it will hold. You really don't have to explain it. You should, and you should be open to questions but you don't have to. And I see all the time where people explain first and answer maybe second. Sometimes they never even answer. Right, right. And you know, there's, I think there's a lot of reasons that that happens. And, and sometimes it's on the one hand, people are just trying to figure out what their answer is. And they're sort of thinking aloud and, and trying to work it out as they go. So they take you along for the ride through the twisty turny maze of their own thought processes, which is can definitely be exhausting. So that's part of the challenge. There's also, you know, we, we talked a couple of times today about uh, intercultural communication and using foreign languages and that that idea of get to the point and then if explanation is needed, give it, is, is very much an American business cultural orientation to speaking, whereas uh, a lot of other cultures, uh, you know, East Asian, Latin American, and, and many others for that matter in Africa, et cetera, are and grossly generalizing by continent here, but it, nevertheless is uh, to where you do need to give the background and uh, show the context to help people understand how you got to your conclusion, because they will otherwise feel like, well, how could I just accept what you've said when you haven't given me the background? But when, despite the fact that we're speaking in English, that trans that doesn't necessarily translate culturally. So knowing your audience, knowing your context, knowing do these people want the background first or just the point, and being able to translate the, the expectation of the culture and context is so crucial to being able to to know when that's needed and not. But just in general, the skill that you mentioned of do you know what your own point is? Can you just make the point whether or not they want the background? I think that's crucial too. Giving background that's meaningful versus because I'm still thinking aloud is a very different ballgame. Yeah, it is. And it it goes, by the way, it, it's not restricted to cross cultures and cross countries borders. Uh, my one of my first uh, roles in, in IBM was doing state government relations and mm. uh, Kentucky was in my territory. And uh, I learned very quickly, this New Yorker from Buffalo, that a conversation was going to be a disaster. Uh, and I certainly wasn't going to be effective at advocating my point of view or my company's point of view. If I didn't begin every conversation with college basketball, horse racing, and bourbon. <laughs> So you had some uh, some quick studying to do, did you? Uh, the, your point, Laura, about cultural assimilation—it's really, really important. And you know the, but you, uh, you know, if somebody said to me, "What, what do you think is the the one of your best skills is being confident in your substance, so that you know what you're talking about, but being humble and appreciative in your delivery, because uh, people don't like to be talked at." Right. And they don't like to feel you're not interested in their point of view. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, I want to, there's a word that you use that I'm, I want to qualify. Uh, I think there's a distinction between cultural assimilation and, and acculturation. You know, people sure. tend, can often get their backs up when they hear uh, a, a generalized word like assimilation feeling. I always think of the star and I'm not a Trekkie, but for some reason I go back to Star Trek and the Borg, the notion of like assimilate or be destroyed. Like you will abandon all of your own thoughts, feelings, beliefs, values, et cetera, and you'll do it our way or you'll be destroyed right. versus like, can you learn what's important to these people and learn to do things their way? And not, not in a way that's inauthentic to you, just in a way that helps you to get through to them. And you know what, if you're in Kentucky and they need to talk about college basketball, about, uh, about bourbon and about horse racing, okay, I can learn to talk about those things too. Then, you know, we'll get, we'll open up the connections and we'll go from there. That's, that's not, I don't feel like that's, even though I don't know anything about any of those three, that would not be, you know, I wouldn't feel inauthentic. Learning. It might be a little challenging perhaps to learn it. No, certainly not more challenging than learning to speak Mandarin, but right. uh, would, it's just that extension of identity to learn to connect with more people. So I'm really glad you had a chance to bring that up. Thank you for doing so. So let's talk now about managing others, leading others. Um, Talk to me about executive presence, otherwise known as leadership presence, command presence. It has lots of names, but there's something about it that's an X factor. Like how do you recognize a leader when you see him or her, regardless of title? Yeah, I'll go back to what I said about, um, I think executive presence requires uh, somebody to be confident in their substance, uh, leading to being authoritative in impression. Uh, so that they are viewed as having credibility in their topic. Uh, the way I, I see people who are best at it pull that off is by staying in their zone. Um, don't have confidence in your subject on something you don't really have any, any experience with. Don't be authoritative in something that you don't have any experience and insights in. Remember, insights come only from experience. Mm. So um, stay in your zone is another really important characteristic of having executive presence. Now your zone, as you move up or as you, you take on more responsibilities, whether it's up or horizontal, uh, your zone gets bigger. And so you have actually a, an interesting needle to thread between staying uh, confident and uh, credible in your substance as you have more substance to be responsible for. Uh, but the good executive in my experience knows not to overreach their credibility, authority, and expertise. Um, and the other defining attribute is they're willing to make a decision. Mm. Executive presence uh, requires you to have a point of view and be prepared to make a decision. Uh, when it's important to make that decision, right? And sometimes people make decisions too quickly before it's necessary. Uh, sometimes some people never want to make a decision, and I don't consider that to be in your description of executive uh, presence. Sure, absolutely. And when you are looking to to groom someone to hire, promote in, into some sort of a leadership role. What's a communication skill that they have to have? And what's something that on the flip side, you would say to yourself, mm, yeah, this person's really good, but it's not going to work. Uh, it's a good one. I, I really like interviewing. I like hiring people and I like managing people. And I, I like it for some of the reasons that your question kind of pokes at. The first, I, I can think of three things. The first is they have to have good listening skills. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have good listening skills, and if they don't look you in the eye when they're speaking to you, that's an alarm for me. And it's almost a derailment factor, and not entirely, but but pretty pretty usually. Um, second is they have to have a point of view, and they have to know how to convey their point of view. And by the way, it's a positive characteristic to say I don't know, uh, or um, I could be wrong. But my point of view is, which means that they have the willingness and the ability to move forward or to take action. Mm. And the third one is really, it's kind of a personality uh, 
attribute, which says, uh, somebody says, yeah, uh, Laura, would you do this? And you say, yes, and um, how about this as well? Have we thought about that? As opposed to yes, but. Mm. Those are three things that pop have popped up through my experiences uh, in hiring and, and interviewing with people that are real markers for me. And the listening skill one, I, I describe as uh, there's a tool that I use and it's uh, somebody, uh, a lawyer from Lansing, Michigan taught me this a long time ago. And he just, when he first said it, I, I had no idea what he was talking about. And he said, you know, Chris, we've got to figure out the WIFMA matrix. And I said, Richard, what's the WIFMA matrix? Yeah. He, said, he said, what's in it for me? Yes. You have to be able to know if you're talking to me, what's in it for me? So uh, people who have the capacity to understand the WIFMA matrix uh, through good listening skills, having a point of view uh, are really important. Yeah, it's what I like to refer to as the uh, world's most popular radio station, WIFM. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> what's in it for me? Right. All right, well, Chris, this is going to bring us to our speed round. And these are three topics that are very uh, commonly brought up in my training sessions with clients. Uh, people often are raising these issues sometimes in where they have this, this false binary in their minds. There's a sense of everything is very black and white and you have to be this or that or uh, some, some false associations here. So I'm going to give you those black and white choices that they've got in their mind. I'm going to ask you to pick one for each, and then we'll get into the gray, and I'll ask you for a little bit more specification. So first, public speaking, love it or hate it? Love it. Can you give us one tip then in that world that makes you love it? How do you manage your nerves and or speak with confidence even when you don't feel it? Well, the reason I love it, it's an opportunity to inspire somebody else or other people. Uh, and that goes back to what I was saying before. You have to have um, inspiration really is, it's a balancing act between vision and passion. Mm. And so if you have vision about a circumstance and you feel that something can be, things can be made better, then having the opportunity uh, to speak in public uh, is really a gift and you shouldn't take advantage, you shouldn't uh, take it lightly. Uh, um, no, I think that's a great, I love that quote. Uh, it's, a, it's a balancing act between vision and passion. And I want everybody out there to really uh, clamp onto that one and, and digest it a little bit because that's, that's quite the North Star to lead with. Now, what about where do you yeah, fall? I mean, if you have too much, if you have, I'm sorry, but if you, have, if you have too much vision and not enough passion, people think you're giving an academic lecture. Yes. If you have too much passion and not enough vision, people think you're just reactive. So you've got to find the balance. If you want to inspire somebody to move and to act, yes. you, have to, you, have to, you have to find the right uh, balance in between those two things. And if you're not speaking to inspire someone to act, then why exactly are you speaking? Right. What, what well, are we missing here? At least that's my reason. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, heck, look, everything we're talking about here, speaking to influence. Influence means inspiring a change, of course, in action. So now what about this? Introvert or extrovert? Where do you fall? Uh, extrovert. As an extrovert, what's a, what's a natural strength and what's an area for growth? Well, I like, I like engaging with people. I like asking people questions. Um, it's, uh, it's an opportunity to learn. I mean, that's really, that's why I like it because I know I don't, you know, know everything I would like to know. You are somebody who is generally comfortable in, in just about every context. I don't think I've ever seen you in a, in a crowd where you weren't able to connect. Um, share with me, or share with our, our audience. You had told me once about a time when you were at an APEC conference and had a rather interesting uh, encounter with an unexpected audience or found yourself the audience unexpectedly. You want to share that? This is at the opposite end of the necktie. Okay. <laughs> this, this is absolutely not a Seinfeld uh, episode. So APEC, which is the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Organization is uh, comprised of 21 countries uh, that border uh, the uh, Pacific Ocean and Asia. The United States, Canada, Mexico, Chile, Peru are, mm -hmm. are the members uh, in our hemisphere. Uh, 
every year they hold a ministerial meeting. And in 1997, the ministerial meeting was hosted by Canada and held in Vancouver. And I had the ability to attend uh, as a uh, kind of an observer participant and as such was able to have access to a reception prior to a big gala dinner. And so I got to the, I got to the reception. Uh, I was by myself. I got to the reception and uh, I was just standing right in, in the doorway there getting my credential and in walks President Clinton by himself. <laughs> no staff, nothing. Highly unusual. Okay. So uh, he comes, I go up and say hello and uh, we shake hands and he says, Hey, what, you know, so what's going on here? What are we doing? What's, what's, what's the, what's the story? What's the script? So I said, well, <laughs> wasn't my job to tell him what his what his script was but i couldn't let that opportunity go so uh it was it would have been irresponsible of me not to not to help him uh work his way through the crowd so i said well why don't we go over and and talk to uh the prime minister of singapore so yeah 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 good idea so we did um well, with the prime minister of Singapore was the president of China, was the prime minister of Japan and the prime minister and the president of the Philippines and me. <laughs> Which so, one of these is not like the other. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, wasn't up to me to say, OK, everybody, this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, it was up to me to um, take it, you know, make the most out of a situation that any good public affairs corporate lobbyist would die to be <laughs> yeah, living uh, this dream. Uh, and I didn't have any competition. There was nobody there other than these six world leaders talking. So that was a, it was a pretty, I had to pivot. I had to decide what to do. I had to do it the right way. And I had to get something from it. And, you know, as you can imagine, getting, listening to six, uh, country leaders talk among themselves about the trade uh, frictions in, in Asia at that point in time was pretty useful. So this is not a time uh, for anybody out there who says, well, I'm not good at small talk. I'm not good at introducing myself to new people. I'm not good at working a room. I'm not good at thinking on my feet. These are the times you dig deep. You find <laughs> you find the conversation. You you put aside any, well, but who am I to do this or to do that? You put aside your your any sort of head trash about whether you're smart enough, charismatic enough, whatever. And you just you look. You have no time. choice. You yeah. have no choice. You have to get it done. That you're not going to get a second chance at this so no. make it happen make it work for you that's uh i that would be a fun uh, terrifying but really fun and exciting opportunity to find myself in now you know why i said it wasn't a, it wasn't another seinfeld episode no no exactly this would, this would be more like the friends episode the one about the apec conference <laughs> uh, then how can people learn more about you the center for global enterprise and mercator 21. Well, the easiest way to learn about the Center for Global Enterprise is www.thecge.net. You'll see everything there. We have a great organization and a great board of directors. Uh, me, you can you can Google me, I guess, or you know, send, me, <laughs> send me an email if you want it. At and I'll, we'll put everything in the, uh, we'll put all the, the URLs and things in the show notes. And Mercator 21 has a, uh, a distinctive uh, website because of the name Mercator. M-E-R-C-A-T-O-R-X-X-I.com. And people frequently ask me, where did you come up with that name? And, <laughs> and I said, well, the short answer to your question is I had made the decision to leave IBM after 25 years. And I was going to open up my new company on April 1st, 2009, in the middle of the Great Recession. And 50% of the people I told I was doing this said, I think you need to go to the hospital. <laughs> Clearly you have lost, lost your, your mind. Yeah. The other and the other 50% said, great, great ideas. Super. All, all your reasons are make sense. Were those the 50% who wanted your job? Uh, maybe. I don't I don't remember. <laughs> uh, but we were sitting uh, so my my family said, well, what are you going to call this company? I said, you know, that's a really good question. I have no idea. And we were on a family vacation sitting around a dinner table and we said, all right, we're not leaving this table until we come up with the name for the, my new company. And we came up with Mercator, as in uh, Mercator, the first person to ever chart the globe on a map. Uh, and 21, because I figured 
it was going to be the 21st century soon, and I would be dead by the 22nd century, so I wouldn't have to worry about Mercator 22. But I, well, there we go. And look, 20th century Fox turned into 21st century Fox, and we, I'm sure <laughs> if there is such a reason, a call to do so, you'll be able to figure out how to adjust that as well. That would be a good problem to have, wouldn't it? It, it would be a good problem to have. <laughs> okay. Chris, once again, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Laura, thank you. It's been a great pleasure and happy birthday. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody else out there for listening and tuning in. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, if you want to download my quick start guide to mastering the three C's, command the room, connect with the audience and close the deal, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.